So today we are going to talk about two topics. The first topic is visualization lemma, where what we are going to do is look at the range space of the function and the constraints and try and understand what exactly it means to have geometric multipliers and um, and the uh, infimum of Lagrangian. And then we are going to extend this analysis to a very important result in the theory of optimization called weak duality theorem. So we are going to talk about dual problems and then we are going to talk about the weak duality theorem which um, uh, which tries to understand the difference between the primal problem and the dual problem that I was alluding to towards the end of my previous lecture. Okay, so in order to understand visualization lemma, I am going to first define a set S, which is the set of GX and FX such well, in R, R cross R such that X is in the capital set X. Okay, so this is the range of constraints. And this is the range of objective function. Okay, and the way we are going to plot this, uh, the, the S here is, I'm going to plot GX on the X axis. I'm going to plot FX on the Y axis. And my S is going to look something like this. This is my set capital S. Okay, this is a completely different way of looking at this optimization problem in comparison to the previous method we were, where we were looking at the optimization algorithm from the point of view of the set X itself. So this is my set X and we were looking at how exactly are we going to converse to the point X star that satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. Okay, this was our, so, so this is the new, this is the new way of looking at optimization. Not in the primal, so this is the primal space. So we're not looking at in the primal space, we are look, going to look at the range of the function and the constraint. Now, if you can tell me which area within this set S is the feasible region, corresponds to the feasible region, so, so any thoughts, what is the feasible, so what are the points in the feasible region in the set capital S? Okay, so feasible region, so what is the feasible region? Sorry, go ahead. Everything on the left side of the uh, y axis. That's right. Everything on the left side of the y axis. So this is the area where gx is less than zero. In this area, my gx is less than equal to zero. Okay. So, so when we are trying to optimize in the feasible region, we are essentially looking at optimizing the function in this particular area. Let me draw it in a different color. So in this area, this is where we would like to minimize the function. Okay. And you may notice that in this case, the minimum value of the function actually occurs at this point. So this is the point at, this is my F star. Okay. All right. So in order to understand the geometric properties of the Lagrangian, let's try to define a few terms first. 
So I'm going to define H mu transpose z plus mu naught. Well, there is no transpose with w because w is a scalar equals to some constant c. So any hyperplane in RR cross R can be written in this fashion. So mu is a vector, mu naught is a scalar, c is a scalar. Okay, so this hyperplane, this is my RR, this is my R, this is my hyperplane H. Now, if I pick a point here, let's say I pick a point Z bar W bar on this hyperplane. I can plug the value into this expression for the hyperplane and I get mu transpose z bar plus mu naught w bar equals to c. Okay, so I, I get the value of c exactly as a function of z bar and w bar and the parameters that defines the hyperplane, which is mu transpose and mu naught. So in fact, I can lit I can write the expression for this hyperplane in the following fashion, mu transpose z plus mu naught times w equals to mu transpose z bar plus mu naught w bar. Okay, it's the same hyperplane. As long as we know one point that lies on the hyperplane, um, I get the expression for the hyperplane as a function of that point. This is my hyperplane H. <clears throat> what is this value here? Can someone tell me what is this value or the Y intercept of this hyperplane? What is this equal to? I'll let you guys think about it. Your g of x is zero. Sorry, can you say that again? What What is the uh, value? Where the, yeah. Uh, where g of x will be zero. Z is zero. Yeah. So where so z? G is of x. Uh, e of x. The, the constraints will be zero. Yeah. Well, right now, just talk in terms of z and w. Nothing. Okay. Else. Okay. okay? So what okay. is the value of this point? Zero W. W equals to zero. Not W equals to zero. Okay. So this will be oh, equal to P. Oh, well, it will be C if, uh, okay, let me just write. So this is actually, uh, So at that point, my Z is equal to zero. So my W equals to mu transpose, well, C over mu naught. So this is actually C over mu naught. Okay, so what I did was I substituted Z equals to zero. So at this point, my Z is equal to zero and I have the the intercept, the value of the intercept is exactly the value of W uh, at this point when Z is equal to zero. So I substituted Z equals to zero. I get uh, C mu naught W equals to C. And so I took mu naught on the other side and I get W equals to C over mu naught. So that gives me the Y intercept of this hyperplane. Okay. 
So there are two things we learn. First is once we specify a point on this hyperplane, we can figure out the entire expression for the hyperplane use because of this equality. And this would become the expression for the hyperplane. And so if I want to find out the y-intercept, I just have to substitute z equals to zero and find the value for of w uh, corresponding to that point on the hyperplane. Okay. Now, assuming that mu naught is not equal to zero, you can divide the entire expression for the hyperplane by mu naught and what you get is divide the expression of H by mu naught and we can get the usual expression. So this is of course mu over mu naught transpose Z plus W equals to mu over mu naught transpose z bar plus w bar. Okay. Such a hyperplane is known as non-vertical hyperplane. So when mu naught is not equal to zero, it's called non-vertical hyperplane because the hyperplane is going to look like as follows. So these are all hyperplane H1, H2 that is not vertical. Whereas this hyperplane, let me put it in a different color. This hyperplane S3 is vertical. So here mu naught is equal to zero. Okay, so that's why this uh, this hyperplane appears vertical. Okay, I. So this is all the geometry I wanted you to recall about hyperplanes in higher dimensional spaces. If you have any questions, uh, please ask me now. Okay, is the different difference between vertical and non-vertical hyperplane clear? Okay, a vertical hyperplane looks parallel to the y-axis where mu naught is equal to zero. Whereas a non-vertical hyperplane would appear slanting or it could even be flat. So this is also a non-vertical hyperplane. Um, okay, but a vertical hyperplane will look like this, H3. Okay. If there are no question, let's delve a little bit more deeper into this hyperplane business. So here is my RR, my R, and I draw a hyperplane like this. Well, let me use a different color. So this is my hyperplane. It's a non-vertical hyperplane. And this hyperplane divides the space into two parts. This is known as the positive half space. This is known as the negative half space. This is my H. Okay, so the hyperplane's uh, expression is mu transpose Z plus W naught equals to C. The positive half space, we have mu transpose Z plus W naught greater than C or greater than equal to C. And in the negative half space, I have mu transpose C by, well, there should not be any W naught here. W is less than 
equal to C. This is my positive half space. This is my negative half space. So what happened to the new note in the equation for the half space? Yeah, so I'm just assuming non-vertical line, non-vertical half space. So I'm just setting mu naught equals to one. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just going to set mu naught equals to one for by uh, appropriately scaling mu transpose, I can just okay, set mu so naught equals to one throughout. The yeah. Mu transpose in this case is a scaled mu. That's right. By my mu that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Okay. This intercept here is exactly equal to C because now the mu naught is equal to one. So the intercept is exactly equal to C. Okay. So Let's recap. So we talked about hyperplane in the space RR cross R. We understood the Y intercept of this hyperplane. We understood the notion of vertical and non-vertical hyperplane. And we understood the notion of positive half space and negative half space of a hyperplane. Okay. Um, so these are all the stuff we need to understand uh, the geometric picture has to be clear in our head be before I proceed forward. Now let's, so, so far we have looked at the space RR cross R and we have looked at the different facets of a hyperplane in this particular uh, space. Now let's superimpose S on top of this. So this is my RR, this is my R. I'm going to draw a set S. This is my set S, which is GX comma FX, X in capital X. And let's pick a point. I just want to pick a point. This point is actually Oh, there was one more thing I wanted to talk about in the hyperplane business. Um, okay, I, I'll let you guys note this figure and then I'll go back to the hyperplane figure just for a quick second. Okay, let me go back up into the hyperplane figure. So in this particular figure, you see this hyperplane, the, the uh, normal to the hyperplane is given by this vector, which is mu one. This is the normal to the hyperplane, which can be easily seen because if you take the gradient of the hyperplane, that's exactly equal to mu one. So that's the normal to the hyperplane. And if your hyperplane is in this direction, then it means that mu is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. I want to contrast this with a hyperplane that, so if your hyperplane was like this, then your mu is not greater than or equal to zero. The normal would be mu one. This is the normal vector to the hyperplane. And here mu is not greater than or equal to zero. But in this case, mu is greater than or equal to zero. So your hyperplane has to be slanting in this way in order for mu to be greater than or equal to zero. So this is something you can, uh, you can see from uh, you know, just plotting the hyperplanes and looking at the expressions. Okay, so if you plot the hyperplane in this way, you will find that mu is greater than or equal to zero. If you plot the hyperplane this way, you will find that mu is 
not greater than or equal to zero. Some elements of mu may be less than zero, or yeah. Okay, so now uh, remember that in the context of geometric multiplier, we had required that mu be greater than or equal to zero. So let's try to draw a hyperplane that passes through this point. So what is this point? This point is g of x bar comma f of x bar. I just pick some random x bar and I look at this point, which is g of x bar comma f of x bar. I have mu greater than or equal to zero and I want to draw a hyperplane that passes through this point and has a normal mu and one. Let me draw that. The normal to this hyperplane is mu one. The hyperplane passes through g of x bar comma f of x bar. <clears throat> and it looks uh, like this in the figure. So the first question is, what is the expression for the hyperplane H here? What's the expression for this hyperplane? Okay, so we know um, mu comma one is the normal, mu is greater than or equal to zero. We know a point that lies on this hyperplane, which is g of x bar comma f of x bar. So what would the expression be? Mu transpose g of x bar plus uh, mu plus f of x bar. Yeah, great. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. What is mu transpose g of x bar plus f of x bar? We have given this expression a specific name. What is that name? That's exactly equal to the Lagrangian at x bar comma mu, right? That's the expression for the Lagrangian, f plus mu transpose g. Okay, so this is my, this is going to act as my constant c that appears in the expression for the hyperplane. Okay, so what is this intercept, the y-intercept here? What's the value of the y-intercept? C, which is the Lagrange multiplier. Yeah, uh, it'll be C. Uh, there is so remember mu naught is equal to one here, so we don't have. I mean mu naught is implicitly assumed to be one here. So this was C over mu naught, but because mu naught is one, it's exactly equal to L of x bar comma mu. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the first visualization lemma, which states that, um, I don't know where I should write it. I wish I had a larger board. Uh, so let me write it as visualization lemma part one, which is normal is mu one,
passing through g of x bar f of x bar implies y intercept is equal to l of x bar comma mu okay that's first part of the visualization lemma okay any questions on this particular lemma what we have done is a visual proof of this statement okay now let's look at the same uh, figure again this is rr this is r this is my set s this was my hyperplane with normal mu1 i'm going to translate this hyperplane okay so i'm going to draw a lot of different hyperplanes all of which have the same same normal have to be a bit careful okay so these all hyperplanes have normal mu1 okay and they all have their corresponding y intercepts these are all the y intercepts for these hyperplanes that i have drawn all of them are parallel to each other now for this hyperplane uh, so let me let me give it a name h1 h2 h3 h4 h5 so i have five hyperplanes here so i see that for h1 and h2 hyperplanes h1 and h2 the set s is in the positive half space okay so s is in positive half space of h1 and h2 and let me give it the corresponding intercept c1 c2 c3 c4 c5 okay so think about so look at the figure and we want to come up with so i i i want to now go to the second statement of the visualization lemma what that says is among all the hyperplanes so in this case that so among all the hyperplanes for which s is in the positive half space so in this case hyperplane h1 and h2 the largest intercept of the y axis is actually equal to c2 and what c2 is equal to this is let me use a different color okay so among all hyperplanes for which the set s is in the positive half space the maximum intercept in the y axis is exactly equal to the infimum of the lagrangian
okay so see what h2 is doing so h2 is barely touching the set s and the entire set s is in the positive half space and if i look at the y intercept of h2 that's exactly equal to the infimum of the lagrangian with with uh, that particular value of mu which is normal to the hyperplane Okay, that's the second visualization lemma. Any question on this second visualization lemma? Are you convinced that this is equal to the infimum of the Lagrangian? Maybe it's not that obvious. Professor, can you explain a little more about the infimum yeah. part? Yeah, yeah. So let me explain a little bit more about the infimum part. So if you look at any of this value C1, C3, C4, C5, um, okay, let's, let's look at C2. So C2 is So I want to say, well, okay, let's say C3 is L of X3 comma mu. C4 is L of X4 comma mu. Okay, so let's say this is my point GX3 comma FX3. There is a point GX4 comma FX4. So all of these intercepts are uh, equal to the Lagrangian evaluated at some point, okay? Now, because S is in the positive half space of H2, since S is in the positive half space of H2, we have mu transpose gx plus fx is greater than or equal to c2. Okay, because c3, c4, all of these are greater than or equal to c2. Um, so basically mu transpose gx for any x, this is for any x in capital X. Okay, so this implies that inf over x in x, L of x comma mu is greater than or equal to C2. Okay. But that's, that's still not equal to C2, so I need to somehow argue the other way around as well. And remember what I had mentioned was C2 is the maximum intercept for all the hyperplanes that are parallel to, that has a normal mu comma one. So C2, so, so, so we know that C2 is the maximum intercept. Uh, so C1 is an intercept lower than that and S is completely in the positive half space of H1, but among all the hyperplanes for which S is in the positive half space, the maximum intercept is equal to C2. So, which means that if you pick any C greater than C2, then S is not in the s is uh, 
not in the positive half space. New transpose Z plus W equals to C. Okay, so this is the first equality. This is the second argument. And the first argument plus the second argument implies that C2 equals to the infimum of the Lagrangian. Okay, the second argument is, I mean, the reason why I'm writing the second argument here is because uh, I'm looking at all the hyperplanes such that S is in the positive half space of that hyperplane. So I'm looking at H1 and H2 and I'm looking at the maximum intercept that such hyperplanes can make with respect to the Y axis. So that's what the second argument here is about. And if you, uh, Look at the first and the second argument, it implies that C2 must be the infimum of the Lagrangian. Okay. So what we have done is uh, understood the geometry of the set capital S. And in particular, we are able to visualize what the infimum of the Lagrangian looks like as an intercept of certain hyperplanes on the y-axis, okay? The third visualization lemma says that, uh, let me just write the third visualization lemma. So, part three. which is mu star is geometric multiplier if and only if mu star is greater than or equal to zero and among all H such that S is in positive half space of H F star is the highest attain intercept, uh, Y intercept. Okay, now I want to draw another figure to illustrate this point. This is my F star. This is my set S, this is my R, R, R.
I have to make a small correction here. So among all edge with normal, mu star one. So I am, I've, I'm, I've drawn here many hyperplanes with normal mu star one. And as you can observe, the largest intercept is equal to F star here. So this is the F star. And that's the largest intercept you can make for all the hyperplanes with normal mu star comma one with S in the positive half space of H. Okay. I know that in the first instance, when you see this lemma, um, uh, understanding all these visualization is not that easy. So after the lecture, I would highly encourage you to go back and reread all these uh, or look at these uh, figures carefully and convince yourself about these three results. It's going to take some time before you are completely comfortable with the three statements of this visualization lemma. But it gives you a nice geometric intuition about the optimality properties of a function or an optimization problem using purely geometric uh, means. Without, so we have not used derivatives and all that stuff anywhere until now. Okay. So now we will talk about weak duality theorem, which basically extends the notion of visualization lemma into a nice set of mathematical inequality. So let me define Q mu as the infimum of the Lagrangian with respect to X. So now we have the primal problem, which is to minimize fx such that gx is less than or equal to zero. I am now going to write the dual problem, which is maximize q mu such that mu is greater than or equal to zero. Let's call the optimal value of the primal problem as F star. And let's call the optimal value of the dual problem as Q star. Okay. So the weak duality theorem is the following. Q star is always less than equal to F star. Okay. 
so we started with a primal optimization problem we constructed the lagrangian we took the infimum of the lagrangian over all x in x and we constructed q mu um, as a uh, we 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 call this particular function as q mu okay now we can formulate a corresponding dual problem where we are maximizing so this was minimization problem now i'm talking about maximization problem of this function q which is a function of mu and i want to maximize it over all mu greater than or equal to 0 and i'm going to let i'm i'm going to call this value q star which is the optimal value to the dual problem turns out from the weak duality theorem that q star is less than or equal to f star we also have two more associated results the first result is q is concave so doesn't matter what kind of function f and g is q is always concave okay and the set d such that mu greater than or equal to 0 q mu q mu is greater than minus infinity is convex Okay, so of course, when you are taking the maximization over all mu greater than or equal to zero, you want to eliminate the situation where the value of Q is going to be minus infinity. So if you eliminate that, that those sets of mu such that Q mu is greater than minus infinity, then, then uh, the set is a convex set. So in short, the dual problem is a convex problem. Okay, so we start with some, some problem which is potentially non-convex, which may be defined only over integers or only over discrete state space X. But the dual problem is always a convex problem. Okay, and so therefore you can actually solve in some, in most cases you can solve the dual problem using the usual optimization algorithms, assuming that you can compute the derivative or sub differential of Q function. What weak duality theorem says is Q star will give you a lower bound on the value of F star. Okay, and that's where weak duality theorem is usually invoked because you want to find a lower bound on F star. And the weak duality theorem says Q star is a lower bound on F star. Okay, so I'm going to prove these two results in the next class, but in this class, I'm just going to prove the weak duality theorem, which is Q star is less than or equal to F star. So at this point of time, any questions about the primal problem and the dual problem before I jump on to the proof? Okay. So seems like there are no questions. So you start with a primal problem, you construct a dual problem. The dual problem is always convex and the optimal value of the dual problem is less than or equal to the optimal value of the primal problem. Now let's look at the proof of weak duality theorem. So for all mu greater than zero and x in x such that gx is less than or equal to zero. We have
well, let me just write it as x mu. Okay, so I pick any mu which is non-negative. Okay, so mu is a vector, so all its elements have to be non-negative. I can pick any x in the feasible set x, capital X, such that gx is less than equal to zero. And I know that q mu, the way I have defined it is infimum of the Lagrangian. So that's certainly less than equal to the Lagrangian evaluated at any point x in the set capital X which is of course equal to by definition, the function f plus mu transpose g, which is, remember mu is non-negative, g is non-positive. So mu transpose gx is certainly negative or I mean uh, non-positive and therefore it must be less than equal to the fx. This is of course for all x in capital X such that gx is less than equal to zero. You know, that's by assumption. That's by assumption here. So I can take the infimum on the right side. And what I get is Q mu equals to or less than equal to infimum over X in X. GX is less than equal to zero F of X. Okay, so since Q mu is less than equal to F of X for all such feasible X, I can just take the infimum over all X on the right side and I get this inequality. Now, I'm just going to take supremum. Remember that this is equal to F star. The right hand side is equal to F star. Now I can take supremum My left side depends on mu. My right side, do, right side doesn't depend on mu. And this expression holds for all mu greater than equal to zero. So I can take the supremum over all mu greater than equal to zero and I get Q star is less than equal to F star, which yields the weak duality theorem. Okay, just basic algebra and some infimum, supremum uh, stuff that we all know about and we are very comfortable with allows us to derive the weak duality result. Okay, so what I'm going to do in the next class is we will talk about the concavity of Q, the convexity of the set D and also what is the pictorial significance of the weak duality theorem. So we're going to look at the geometry of the set S and we'll understand, try and understand where the uh, weak duality is strict, which means Q star is strictly less than F star and where Q star is equal to F star. So we'll look at some of the different situations where that happens and uh, some consequences of the weak duality theorem. Uh, we'll study it in the next class. Uh, also, we'll derive several, we'll derive uh, problems where, we'll derive the dual problems for uh, some linear programming primal problems or quadratic programming primal problems. So we'll look at that also in the next class. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me now. Uh, I'm also available in the office hours right after the lecture gets over around 3, 3 p.m.
Um, so, so if you want to join my office hours after the class, I'll be happy to take any questions even there as well. Any questions on the material we discussed in today's class? Oh, Professor, uh, yes. can, can you go to the lemma three and lemma two? Yes. This is lemma three, yes. This yeah, is, so this is lemma two, yeah. So in lemma two, you're say, telling the Lagrangian is, will be the infimum. That means the, the lowest possible value right. it's going to take right and, and then in lemma in, in the lemma three it, it kind of changed the wordings to something like the maximum possible value kind of i, I I'm, maybe i'm yeah. confusing myself with right. the way right. lemma three is being introduced so lemma two is the the highest the maximum intercept of all the hyperplanes that are below the set s yes Okay, so this is the highest attained intercept. C2 is the highest attained intercept among all the hyperplanes that is below S, but has yeah. a normal mu one. Okay. okay. Now lemma three is saying that now let's pick mu to be mu star. Okay, so now I'm picking a very specific mu star, which is the geometric multiplier for okay. that problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, then what I'm, what the, this lemma is saying that the highest intercept is actually equal to F star. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. So mu yeah. star is a geometric multiplier if and only if mu star is greater than zero and the f star is the highest attained y intercept of the hyperplanes. Mm, okay. Yeah. And Thanks. If these hyperplanes have normal mu star one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think I understood yeah. wrongly then. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any other question? All right, so I'll see you guys in my office hours a few minutes from now.